Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gregor McLennan. This is Stephen um, Whitmore. We work for a nonprofit called Digital Democracy that works with marginalized communities around the world to empower them to use technology to defend their rights. And we are working uh, with communities to help them create maps of their neighborhood. Their neighborhood, in this case, uh, looks like this. Um, perhaps quite different to the neighborhoods you might map around the US. There is no internet service here. There is no cell phone service. And um, the relevant features in their neighborhood aren't roads and buildings. They're hunting paths, streams, and the histories of their people in that region. These are all also things that don't appear in satellite images or don't appear in even aerial images. Streams and paths are hidden under the forest cover. So why are these communities making maps and how are they used? Well, first of all, they're often living in areas where there are no maps of their land or their existence. This is about 7 million acres of Wabashan territory in southern Guyana. And on Google Maps, you kind of have two, uh, two small villages and nothing else appearing. Communities want to be able to show that they exist. They want to be able to show their presence and occupation of the land. And um, they want to use that information to uh, advocate for the land rights and recognition of their presence there. This is also a problem because governments are granting natural resource concessions to oil companies and mining companies to their land without their uh, knowledge and ignoring their presence and um, rights to that area. And communities are then using their maps in order to support their advocacy efforts. They're using them to support land rights claims. And it, maps are giving communities a voice in uh, decision making processes and, the, and decisions about resource extraction that affect their lives. So it's giving them a way to engage in these conversations and to present their point of view. But in terms of making the maps, these are communities that are survivors of a colonial history uh, where Europeans have turned up, made maps of the area that have excluded them and marginalized them and ignored their rights. They don't want an organization to turn up and make a map for them. They want to be able to make a map themselves, and they want to control the process and the information for that map and how that information is used. GPS is a great tool for this. It's very easy to learn. It's very easy for everybody to participate in the process of gathering data in order to make a map. But after you've gathered the information on the ground, then what? Traditional GIS is complicated. It's hard to learn. Uh, it, that limits who can participate in the process of actually entering the data and creating a map. And collaboration is really hard with traditional GIS, especially if you have no internet connection. Um, we're working in Ecuador with 50, uh, the Warani people of 54 different villages. That can't be done by one person at a time. It need, we need a way for everybody to, to collaborate. So, that's when we started getting interested in OpenStreetMap and learning about the problems that have already been solved by the community here. OpenStreetMap has already done the work to lower the barrier for people to get involved in editing and creating map data. It is designed from the ground up for collaboration and the solving a really big problem of how do people work together to map the entire world. And it has a data structure that's flexible enough that it can be used to uh, map hunting paths and sacred sites as well as mapping cafes and traffic junctions. The challenge with OSM is that everything is public by default, whereas communities want to maintain the control and decision about what goes into an open map. They also, there are also things that don't belong in OpenStreetMap, like historical data and cultural data, which is crucially important to the, how these communities are trying to use maps. And also, they, as they are working offline, and they don't need to just edit offline. They need to be able to collaborate offline. So we have been working on a peer-to-peer -peer database and a server that replicates the OSM API and a desktop app, which is built upon ID editor and integrates it with a peer-to-peer -peer database that can be used for offline collaborative mapping. I'm going to hand off to 
Stephen, who's going to talk a little bit more about the technology behind all of this and the magic that makes it happen. Hi everyone. Um, there is a human psychology phenomenon where the less you know about something, the more you tend to think you know about it. And just being here for the last few hours has shown me how abundantly little I know about mapping and the ways that it's used. And I'm just very grateful to be here with everything that's being shared. Um, cool. So I think Eric covered some of the main reasons why we use OpenStreetMap. Um, all, the, all these properties here are things that, you know, Google Maps and other project solutions, just they're not, not options. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's why we chose them. Um, so first I want to talk about how traditional map making works. Um, so you have this sort of like uh, um, star diagram where all the clients point to a single server, and that server is the source of truth for all the map data in the world. And then these thin clients come on, like ID and JOSM, and they're able to query like small subsets of all map data in time um, and sort of submit change sets, request change sets. Um, but all, all coordination is reliant on this, this central point. But if you're offline, like what do you, what do, you do, right? So some editors, editors like JOSM can deal with sort of brief periods of, of offlineness. You can queue up your change sets and submit them when you're online again. But what about people who never go online? What about maps that will spend their entire lifetime off of the internet? Um, what then? Well, what if each device was also like OSM.org? If it had like a server and an OSM database built into it, along with the client and the editor all bundled in together. And then what if these programs could talk to each other instead of talking to a central server? So you end up slowly kind of like this, where you have peers instead of servers and clients, where each peer is an editor, a server, and a database all rolled into one. And it's funny how technology tends to mirror the uh, society that, that creates it and the society's values. Um, and I think a peer-to-peer -peer solution tends to mirror the society and values of the people that it wants to serve. So now I want to talk about the da database piece. So there's the osm.org database, which is like the central source of truth. Um, and this works really well in a centralized environment where um, one source of truth and then clients ask for like subsections of that. So traditional databases are operate kind of like a snapshot in time, like what is the current state of all of the nodes, ways, and relations in the world right now? Um, so we have a table here that has um, these three points with three different IDs, and these are the three points that exist in the world right now and their state. But this is kind of fragile, right? So what if we accidentally insert the wrong value? Oh, we need to like find, someone needs to like find a backup somewhere and restore it. Um, what about historic data? Uh, what if we change the format of the database? We need to like, write, write a migration script and hopefully that doesn't get messed up and we're going to have offline time where the server can't work because we're doing the migrations. Um, and of course, it means um, collaboration is limited to one central source of truth. So there's something called Kappa architecture and the main difference is that the, that single source of truth is a data structure called an append-only log, uh, which is just what it sounds like. It's a log of all data operations ever performed in time. So, and it can only be added to, old entries cannot be modified or deleted. So there is a certain power in being able to say that like entry number five is this data, and that will always be true. Um, so this is the same data set, except there's this additional column called sequence number. And these, this is the append only log, so the first entry, second, and so forth. And we see here that, oh, ID numbers 77 and 12 actually have older, older values that are, are different. 
Um, so the, the full set of historic values is always captured and nothing is lost. But then how do you get, if you do just want like the latest values, well, how do you do that? So from these logs, you can create something called uh, materialized views, which are, it's actually just like the data, traditional database I showed you before, except that table is materialized from running a function over every entry in the append-only log. And you could have all kinds of materialized views. In this case, it's this might be taking the latest values for each node. It could be uh, aggregate values of like OSM contributors by region. Um, anything you can run a function for can be run over the log and you can produce up-to-date data. Uh, nine out of 10 time travelers agree that uh, Kappa architecture is a great way to go. If you've used Git, then you are probably familiar with this idea. Um, so these views are really great because they're really cheap. If you can write a function in basically any programming language, you can create a new view. Um, they're incremental. So if I processed up to sequence number 45 and I pull in five more entries, I only need to process those five new entries. And then all the views are updated with the latest data. And they're also disposable. Um, and if I change the, the data format of one of these views, instead of like trying to like update it in place, I can just delete the view and process the log over again from sequence number zero and produce the brand new view with, with the new fields. Um, so that is like very, very durable, very cacheable, which are really nice properties for peer-to-peer -peer environments. What about sync? How do like, if like I've done offline editing and you've done offline editing, how do, how do they actually synchronize? So there's four steps. Uh, the first one is simply figuring out which log entries each peer is missing from the other, um, sending them, appending them to their own local append-only log, and then updating the, uh, all your materialized views with that data. Um, so if, if I sort of like edited a, a node and uh, Gregor edited a node, uh, we would we would both exchange um, our edits, uh, and you'd know you'd know which edits are newer because they would have a higher sequence number than the current sequence number you see in your data set. Uh, a really cool thing about centralized services is that unique identifiers are a really easy problem to solve because the server will just say, uh, just add one to the last newest ID. In offline environments, there's no central source of truth, so no one can say, like, what is the next ID for the next OSM element that I'm creating? Um, so to do this, we basically generate unique 64-bit uh, numbers, and fortunately, that's a really, really large space of numbers, like more than the number of particles in the universe, kind of big. So um, there's a very low odd of collision. Um, I say low with like a little asterisk because it depends on the number of IDs you're generating. If you're working in like the tens of millions of identifiers, 64-bit might not be enough. You start to approach the odds of like winning the lottery for like um, chances of collision. So, but we store IDs as strings in OSM P2P DB. So if you wanted to use like 120-bit or larger, that works. Um, a really tricky open question that we've been stumped on, and I'd love, to, very happy to present here, are forks. Um, an example of this is uh, one of our monitors, Opie, edits a hunting camp offline on his laptop, and Eliza also edits this hunting camp offline, um, the exact same OSM element. And when they go to sync, what happens? Like, which hunting camp is the right one? Are they both correct? Is one correct? Um, it's sort of this like inherently ambiguous situation where you have this append-only log of elements, but then you have a fork where two people are saying different things about the same piece of data at the same time. Um, if you use Git, there's this like catastrophic merge conflict resolution mode where like the world comes to a grinding halt and you need to like figure out how to fix this complicated problem, which is great if you're between like expert and master in Git. But I think tools need to respect the broad diversity of technical experience. Um, right now, we use a model called newest wins, which is whichever of the two elements have a newer timestamp. Just we just show that one, and that's actually a materialized view for for OSM P2P server. 
because most uh, editors these days, like ID, don't know anything about forks. So by presenting just the newest element in a forking situation, um, it mostly works, but obviously there's situations where data get, gets, gets lost or shadowed. Um, yeah, so forking data is natural, and big ambiguity is natural. We want to embrace the subjectivity of the human experience. Um, so there's lots of possible solutions, like social ones, like me and Gregor agree not to map the same place, like the same area, on the same day. Um, there's mechanical solutions, like if I edit some tags and Gregor edits the longitude latitude, maybe those are safe to automatically merge without needing human intervention. Um, human solutions could be like, you know, seeing changes side by side and choosing one or the other. Um, or there could be t more like Git merge resolution like uh, options where like you have like th a three-way merge and you can manually choose fields to pull over and customize it exactly. The nice thing is that because the append only log guarantees that history is never lost, just because we show newest wins right now doesn't mean that if we have a new solution for forks in the future, we can still lay this on top and no data gets lost. Um, so we're excited about finding more solutions to this problem as well as making OSM editors aware of forks. Because um, I think this is a problem for, for if traditional OSM clients want to be able to work offline, even if they prefer osm.org, this is gonna be a problem. Cool, so in summary, OSM is super cool. Um, Having no servers is an extremely powerful thing that, de that sort of demarginalizes communities that wouldn't have access to the internet. Um, we want to reuse existing OSM tech so that we can have a healthy symbiotic relationship with them. Uh, we model data as append only logs for intense durability, and we generate unique IDs using random numbers and cryptography to prevent conflicts. Uh, here are some more links. You can check out MapAO right now at mapao.world for uh, Windows and Mac. Cool. Um, questions? questions? Do you accept Bitcoin donations? <laughs> we could do. Oh, yeah. It's, it's good. Speak to, uh, yeah, speak to me afterwards and we'll set it up. Questions, questions? All right, we got a break coming up. So go ahead and grab some coffee, water, or whatever, and uh, we'll be starting back up here at, uh, at uh, 3.15.